fulfill 2 Chronicles chapter 7. <coughs> 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to look at the uh, first four verses. It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. Does that help any? All right. Kind of like when you say, uh, let's turn to the book of Obadiah, huh? Where is that one at? <laughs> Ain't but one page in the Bible, and it, you know. Yeah, it's kind of hard to miss, uh, kind of hard, yeah, easy to miss that one, but anyway. Second Chronicles chapter 7, look in verse 1, if you will. When Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. May we go to Him in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, as we come again into thy presence today, what a joy it is to know, Father, that you are here among your people today. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of coming together and to meeting with thee, knowing, Lord, that thou art at home always within our hearts, yet very present in a very special way when we gather together to worship thee. And, Father, we thank you for your wonderful presence tonight. We pray, God, that as being almighty and all-knowing, look upon our hearts, Lord, and take away anything from us, Lord, that might hinder us, Lord, from being your people tonight and from worshiping thee in spirit and truth. God, we ask that you would take this weak and fragile preacher, that you'd anoint him, Lord, and fill him with your spirit. And God, use him in a mighty way to speak to thy people. I pray, God, that the spirit would be the true minister tonight. And that, Father, he might tap upon each of our hearts and that we might open unto him. And, Lord, let him have his way within us all. And God, we ask that every heart might be opened, every, every tongue be stopped, that every spirit might stand still before thee tonight, that you, Lord, might have your way in us. And we praise you. We thank you for what you will accomplish. For we pray in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. And amen. Amen. Habakkuk said, the Lord is in his holy temple, and all the world keeps silence before him. I believe there's a time for silence in church, don't you? I believe there's a time to reverence the Lord and stand still. I also believe there's a time to praise God. Uh, David said, not David, but Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's a time and a season for every purpose under the sun. And from the days that uh, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt to the building of the Ark of the Covenant, the 40-year wilderness journey to the time that Joshua led them into the promised land, to the years of the judges with Jephthah and Barak and Samson and Eli and, uh, oh, I guess maybe ending with Samuel and, of course, there was Gideon and uh, so many others. But the house of God was no more than a tent, and it was moved around from place to place, no permanent dwelling for the house of God. And then David got in his heart that he wanted to build a temple for God to dwell in. And of course God said no. But his son Solomon would build the temple. After years of preparation and planning, David uh, acquired all the goods that were needed. All the iron, the silver, the, uh, you know, the, the, the nails and the timbers and the stone. He, he acquired everything that he could to help out his son Solomon. And of course, then when Solomon came to the throne, uh, after a, a few years, he started building the house of God. And the house of God was in building for seven years. What a building that must have been, you know? What a building. And, uh, of course, we can see drawings and representations of it, but I would have really liked to have seen the original house, wouldn't you? And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, they built the temple, and the day came 
for the dedication of the house of God. And Solomon knelt and lifted up his hands to heaven and prayed that wonderful and magnificent prayer to God. And then when he finished the prayer, the, the fire of God fell and consumed the sacrifices there on the brazen altar. And whoa, all the people just were overwhelmed by the power and the presence of God. And that's the way I feel that we ought to be in God's house overwhelmed not by the preaching nor the singing, but by the power and the presence of God among us. Amen. Knowing that He is almighty and all-knowing and that He is here and He wants to fill us to capacity. And my friends, we sometimes will come and get a little dose and we're satisfied until the next time. I want it all, don't you? I want all that God wants to give me. And I want him to fill me to the point of overflowing. You know what happens when he fills you to overflowing? You spill over on other people and they get it too. And that's the wonderful thing about worshiping in the power of the Spirit of God. A very similar thing happened in the New Testament. You'll find the story in Acts chapter 2 when the, uh, when the apostles and the other uh, disciples of the Lord were gathered together. And there in the upper room, the sacrifice had been made by Jesus, uh, what, uh, 50 days earlier. The sacrifice had been made. God had, uh, had uh, Jesus had walked on the earth among them. He had ascended back up into heaven. And for 10 days, they waited for the power. Jesus said, tarry ye in Jerusalem till you be endowed with power from on high. And they tarried the 10 days. And on that 10th day, there in the upper room, the Spirit of God came down like a fire and filled each one of them. And they began to utter languages that that they had never learned and uh, we're not preaching on speaking in tongues tonight but what a glorious thing it is to be filled with the power and presence of God because then and only then are we empowered and enabled and equi equipped uh, to do the work and the labor of God and oh worshiping him in that frame of mind is such an awesome and wonderful thing Matthew 18, uh, 20, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so I still believe uh, because the temple of God is not a building made with hands anymore. The temple of God is the human heart. And God dwells within us, but in a very special way. He is here in power among us as we yield ourselves to Him and allow Him to fill us with His overflowing presence. So I still believe today that when we come together and worship here in this place, the glory of God should fill the house. I believe that when the house of God, uh, that when we come to worship in the house of God, I believe that sinners ought to come under conviction. I believe that God's wayward children ought to be drawn back into the straight and narrow way. I believe that God ought to be preeminent and predominant uh, in the house of God and that everything that is done will be done to His glory and not to our satisfaction. For we don't always please God. Let's be honest with it, you know. We don't always please God in the things that we say and do. But oh, my friends, when we yield to Him, how pleased He is to fill us with His overflowing presence. And so I believe that together in this house, when we worship Him in spirit and in truth, and, and we don't always do that. Sometimes we just go through the motions. Uh, and, and we sing and we, we give and we do this and we do that, but we don't always yield ourselves to Him. But oh, friends, when we do, what an awesome Thing takes place okay the glory of the Lord should fill this house how does he fill the house of God where we worship first of all there must be a recognition of God's proper place in worship do you realize that in most churches today the preacher is the center of attention okay and maybe that's good in some ways but it's not always the best way okay because Jesus Christ ought to be the center of attention every time we come to worship, okay? And some people actually get to the point, I believe, of worshiping the preacher. Uh, and I'm not saying that in a harsh way, but rather that we give our attention and our, our aspirations and every, to what the preacher is saying. But the preacher has very little to do with it. Brother Rex would be willing to tell you every time he preaches a sermon, you know, uh, it fails. 
But every time God preaches through him, what a wonderful thing takes place, you know. And every time we yield ourselves to God and allow him to have his way within our hearts, what takes place? Oh, it's something you can't put in words, okay? That's why I like that song that says, Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, you know. Beyond the sacred page, not just what is written in the book, but when I take that book and imply, apply it to my heart and allow him to have his way within me, then I see something greater than I've ever seen before. Uh, when we... As human beings look out upon the world, we think that we're so special, and we are. We're God's crown of creation. But did you realize that of all the millions of creatures God has made in this world, from bugs to microorganisms to uh, big elephants, and uh, back in Job's day there were dinosaurs, there were T-Rexes, there were brontosaurs, and there were all kinds of huge creatures and great whales that filled the seas and sharks and fishes of all kinds, so many creatures that God has made, the sheep and the goats and the lamb and, and so, so, so many. I can't name them all, okay? Adam could because he named them, but uh, I, I, I think about all of those creatures and yet human beings, as far as we know, human beings are the only ones that can see out beyond what we are by faith and take hold of the unseen and know that He is King and Lord and Master of creation. Now, I, I know that maybe animals know that in some way, uh, but, uh, but as far as I know, human beings are the only one that can see the unseen and worship that which He knows is there. Because, friends, He is there, okay? He is there. Recognition. You remember when Isaiah was there in the temple? And he was so distressed by the sins of his people. And he looked around and he, he, he was almost in despair. And, and he saw God he, in the days of Uzzah. He saw a vision of God in the temple. And God looked out over the congregation. And I suppose maybe the father looked at his son and shook his head. And then looked at the Holy Ghost and maybe shook his head. And he said, who will go for it? Who shall we send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah jumps up and says, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Uh, don't overlook me. Here I am. Gee, or rather, Isaiah said he was high and lifted up. And he's so high that sometimes we don't look up far enough to see how high he really is. But my friends, if there is to be true spiritual worship in the house of God, we must see God as high and lifted up. I know that like, uh, people like to say, and we like to sing, that Jesus is my best friend, and He is. But our friends, He's so much more than that. We like to think of Him as a brother, and He is. He's the closest brother. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And we like to think of the Lord as our best friend, and He is, okay? But He is so, so much more. If we, if we limit Him, it, it just curls my spine sometimes to hear People talk about, well, you know, the man upstairs, <laughs> you know. If that's all he is, is a man upstairs, then he's not God, you know. He is high. He is mighty, all-knowing, all-powerful. He is almighty God. And sometimes we try to bring him down to our level, you know, and say, hey, my best friend is Jesus, you know. <laughs> and I know he is. But, my friends, he is so much more than those things, okay. Don't stop there. Don't rob him of his glory, his divineness, his power, his authority. And believe it or not, it shows in our lives when we leave the house of God. If we haven't lifted him up in prayer, in praise, and in worship to God, then it shows when we leave the house of God. Because we're the same people that entered the church. We're the same when we, when we leave, okay? Uh, and, and a meeting with God ought to change us. <laughs> it ought to make something different in our lives because we have seen the Lord of glory, the King, the Creator, the very one who spoke the worlds into existence. We've come to meet Him and we've heard Him say, My grace is sufficient for thee. Now listen carefully. When is the last time you said to someone, or maybe you uh, heard someone say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that for the church. Now, I suppose there's nothing wrong with saying that, but shouldn't we be doing it for the Lord? You know, shouldn't we be doing it for the Lord? When is the last time you said, I want you to come to my church? 
Invite somebody to come to my church. Come to Brother Rex's church. Come to Brother Buddy's church. Come, you know, that, that's, that's wrong. Because Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It ought to be the Lord's church, okay? And if we're satisfied in it being our church, then that's all it'll ever be, my friends. But if we are not satisfied with that, if we want it to be God's house, then we ought to be saying, why don't you come to the Lord's house this day? Why don't you come meet us at the Lord's house and worship Him today? That scares some people to death, wouldn't it? But uh, you talk about sometimes when, when uh, I, you know, when is the last time you were in church and you felt the, the very power and presence of God and the anointing of the Spirit of God come upon every person present? When is the last time? It ought to happen every Sunday, you know. It ought to happen every time, but it doesn't. Why? Because we are still, uh, we, we don't see him high and lifted up. We still want him to be our best friend, our buddy, buddy, our, uh, our once in a while. Uh, you know, if you had a, I, can, I put it this way. If you see a, a lady at the airport and she's, she's getting married, okay? And she's all dressed up and she's uh, perfumed up and she's uh, uh, painted up her face and she just looks like a million bucks, you know. I mean, she's just, she's just uh, beautiful. And she's waiting. She says, my fiancé is coming on the plane. We're getting married, you know. What, what do you think she's doing? <laughs> she's looking at her watch. Oh, no. Only ten more minutes of free life. Uh-uh. <laughs> Uh, only 10 more minutes and I'm chained forever. She's not like that at all, is she? She's telling everybody, my fiance's coming. He really comes on that plane. We're going to get married and we're going to live happily ever after. We're living, you know, and I'm waiting for him and I can't hardly wait for him to step off of that airplane and, and come in here to see me because I'm expecting him and I, I want him and I love him. I want to marry him. How anxious she is and that's the anxiety we ought to have every time we come to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Lord, I so desire you. What did David say? As the heart panteth after the water brooks, uh, even so panteth my soul after thee, O God. I think that's in Psalm 42. But the idea of it is that we need to expect God's presence in church. And if we come just expecting to, to sleep through a sermon, just to expecting to open the hymn book and sing, and, that, and that's all we came for, friends, and that's all we got, then praise the Lord, you're easy to satisfy. But I want more, amen? I want more. I want to feel the presence of God and the power of God and the transformation of God making me and transforming me into the, uh, the person of His Son. You know what God is doing in our lives today? He is preparing you... And me. He's preparing us to be a king. <laughs> a king and a priest. And he's preparing us to reign with him. Now what do you expect we're going to be doing when we are reigning with him? We're going to be the authority figures over those that we reign over. Okay? We are going to be important people in the kingdom of God. But until that time comes, friends, we are not kings yet, although we are uh, you know, in a way, all right? But we need to come seeking the king, uh, worshiping the king, lifting up the king. He's high and lifted up. He's almighty. He knows my every thought, my downsitting, my uprising. He knows everything about me. And sometimes I'm ashamed of what he knows about me. And I fall on my knees and pray, God, forgive me for I failed you so miserably, okay? Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The coronavirus will not prevail against it. Uh, AIDS and SARS and all the other plagues that have come will not prevail against it. Why? Because God is greater than all of those things in the world. In order for God to fill the house of the Lord, we must recognize His position of authority. We can't put Him in His place. He's in His place. We must recognize Him in His place. Amen? But also there must be a request. A request. There must be a desire for His glory to be present in our, our, our worship. And I already got ahead of myself with Psalm 42. But I've heard people, I heard a man say one time... Uh, in fact, many, many years ago, he was one of my best friends when I worked at the Big Star. 
And, of course, I was the third manager, and he was one of my stock clerks. And uh, uh, he, was a, he was a pretty good worker. He was a little slow, but he was, he was a pretty good worker. But he used to come over to my house, and I had a pool table up in the attic. Now, this is not stuff that I'm proud of, but I, 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 as far as I know, just shooting balls on the table, there's no sin against it. But, but anyway, he liked to come over and, and bring a six-pack with him, and, and we'd shoot pool and have a good time together. I'm not going to tell you what we did with the six-pack. But uh, after I, I, I got saved, I, got, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I noticed he didn't come over for a few weeks. And I, I, I asked him one day, I said, won't you come over uh, and we'll, we'll shoot some more pool tonight. He said, okay. Uh, he said, is it all right if I bring some, you know? And I said, well, if you want to drink it, that's your business. I'm not going to drink it anymore. But uh, you're still welcome to come over, you know. He never came over anymore, you know. Never came over anymore. And I thought about it, you know, I thought he was one of my best friends. Uh, young folks, listen to me. If your friends forsake you because you turn to Christ, they're not your friends, you know. They're not your friends. Uh, if, if they don't want to have any do, anything to do with you because you belong to Jesus Christ, they're not your friends. Or well, they may have tried to be your friends. Uh, may have pretended to be your friends, but they're not your true friends. Why? Because a true friend would want what is best for you, not, not what's best for them, okay? And if they want what's best for themselves rather than for you, then they're not your friends, okay? But I remember some years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, I got word through the grapevine, through my sister and other people, that that man who had been my friend had gotten saved, you know? Praise the Lord. Thank God for that. Maybe I planted a seed. I don't know. Uh, but uh, maybe somebody else watered. I don't know. But God gave the increase. And he got saved. But you know what he said? He said these words. He said, if I had known how wonderful it is to be a Christian, he said, I would have become a Christian back there when Buddy did. Isn't that amazing? Friends, uh, a lot of people don't know what they're missing out on. <laughs> Some people think, boy, how can it be so boring? You've got to go to church every week. My friends, I, I told Brother Rex some time ago, I look forward to coming to church. On Wednesday morning, I go to work praying and rejoicing. I say, Lord, thank God I get to go to church tonight. Thank the Lord, you know. I, it's an exciting thing for me. It's something that I look forward to. And I'm so excited about being in the house of God. It's not true because we see a lot of empty seats out there. You know, A lot of people don't feel the same way I do, all right? But a request, do you really want the power of God to be present in your life? Do you really want the presence of God to be there in worship? As the heart panteth after the water brooks, even so panteth my soul after thee, O God, okay? Do you want to see the glory of the Lord? I mean, do you really want to see the glory of the Lord in the house of the Lord? Could it be so simple a thing as asking? Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock. And when you ask, He will not tell you no. If you want more of the Lord Jesus Christ, He will never say no. Never say no. Isn't that amazing? You are as full of of the Holy Spirit as you want to be. You may not be as full of the Holy Spirit as you can be, but you are as full of the Holy Spirit as you want to be. Okay? And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will do things that will surprise. I, I was in a meeting one time, <coughs> and the power of God was present, and the Spirit was just, it just, whoo, He was so present among the people. And one man got so excited, he jumped up and ran around the church. And some people looked at him like, what's he doing, you know? What's, what, what's wrong with him? <laughs> but if you were there and you could feel the presence of the God, you'd feel, you'd feel like uh, jumping up and shouting too because it's, it was so wonderful, you know? So powerful, so present, Okay. Could it be so simple a thing as asking for the glory of the Lord to fill our worship for sinners to be saved? Uh, you know, put it this way. Did you come to church to just sing and listen to a sermon or did you come to meet God? Okay. 
Did you come to just put your money in the plate and go home? If that's all you came for, that's that you know, and you got it. That's all you wanted. You got it all. Okay. Proverbs eight seventeen says, "I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me." God says, "If you're seeking me, you will find me." And if you come expecting the presence of God, seeking the presence of God, asking for the presence of God, He will be here. Amen. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come into our midst tonight. Jesus said in John 16, 24, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. It's time that we stop merely sitting on the premises and start standing on the promises. Amen. Standing on the promises. Recognition. Request. What does it require else? Repentance. God cannot fill a filthy vessel. God cannot fill a sinful vessel. And all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But my friends, we need to deal with that. An old-fashioned altar is a good place to just kneel down and say, Lord, take this sin away from me. I'm tired of it. I've carried it around for so long and I don't want it anymore. Lord, it's hindering me from serving you and I want to get rid of it. Verse 4 says that Solomon and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. Sacrifices were made for, uh, for sin. Chapter 6, 36 said, There is no man which sinneth not. Then Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned uh, to our own way. There is none righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If God's glory is to fill God's house, there must be a soul-stirring, Bible-believing, preaching of God's word and repentance by the people. It just breaks my heart to... Uh, to, to be in a church where you give invitations Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and no one, no one comes to the altar. It's like they're saying, well, I don't need that, you know. I haven't sinned. <laughs> I don't have anything to repent. Every one of us has something to repent of. Every one of us, okay. If the glory of the Lord is to fill God's house, there must be Bible-believing, devil-disturbing preaching of God's Word. There must be conviction. There must be confession. And there must be conf uh, repentance. You see, when we approach God in prayer and in praise and in worship, God demands that we deal with the sin in our lives. That's why many churches never have revival. Oh, they have revival meetings, but they never have revival. Okay? They never have revival they go and they listen uh, to a sermon and they, they go out and they say, Oh, preacher, I enjoyed that. And they, you know, it never affects them on the inside, you know. Never affects them. Never makes any changes in their lives. And you wonder, what in the world's going on? It's like Jesus is standing outside the door trying to get into the house of God and people won't let him into their temple, okay? They won't let him in and let him have his way within them. He is more than a father, more than a friend, more than a brother. He is God Almighty, and we need to recognize Him as such and worship Him in the power of the Spirit of God. Did you know that we're told to walk in the Spirit? Did you know that we're told to pray in the Spirit? You know, we are to pray in the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to take our words and transform them into the perfect prayer as it approaches God's throne, praying in the Spirit, okay? For the promise, Acts 2.39, is unto you and to your children, to his all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise is unto you, <laughs> to you and to me, okay? Uh, he says, be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord, 1 Peter 1.16, okay? But the glory of the Lord will neither fill nor rest upon unclean vessels and that's why we need that daily cleansing that daily confession before God recognition requests repentance no this is the good one results okay what are the results what happens when we uh, confess our sins and God cleanses us of all sin and we come before him filled with the spirit of God prepared to seek him in the spirit pray in the spirit sing in the spirit worship in the spirit what happens oh friends the world has yet to see it <laughs> 
the, fir- the world has yet to see it. The glory of the Lord filled the house. You know, you could take, of course, if it was dark outside, you could tell the difference. But you could take these chandeliers, I don't know what you call them, lights, whatever. But you could unscrew one light bulb and it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference, would it? You could unscrew one light bulb in every one of the fixtures, it wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. You could probably take two out of every one of the fixtures and it wouldn't make a lot of difference. But if you unscrewed them all and just left one light in every chandelier, it'd make a big difference. If it's dark outside, you know. And then if you started unscrewing each one of them until there's only one light left, and you would say, it's dark in here. But even though there's a light shining, it's dark in here. And I think that's the way it is in so many houses of worship today. There might be one or two that are, I hate to use that terminology, that, that, are, that are lit up by God, okay? That are filled with the Spirit of God. And His light is shining, and you can see it, but it doesn't fill the whole house, okay? Every light needs to be burning. Every heart must be on fire. The Bible says, He maketh His angel spirits and His ministers a flame of fire. And I heard an old preacher told me when I told him the Lord was calling me to preach, uh, Reverend John Owens, way back there in Elizabeth City. He said, well, bud... There's got to be some fire in that pulpit to warm up them pews out there. And he was right. But there's got to be some fire in them pews too so that the light of God's glory will shine through. You know, we're, we're kind of like the moon. We don't have the fire within us. It's not our own. It's His. We don't have the light or the salt within us. It's His. Okay? And people can only see the light of God's presence when you and I are filled so much to the point of overflowing, filled with His power, with His presence, with His glory. And when that happens, you can see the power of God, the the presence of God. Kind of like the moon when, you know, when it's on the other side, when it's on the same side as the sun, you can't see it. We call that the new moon. It's still there. The sun's still shining on it but it's reflecting back toward the sun. You can't see it anymore. And when it starts to come around the earth, you start seeing like a little banana shape until finally it gets all the way around and it's full, okay? And that's the way we need to be filled, filled with His presence. Now, the moon doesn't have any light in itself. It only reflects what the sun gives it. You and I don't have the light, but we have what the sun gives us. And if we dim that, if we quench the Spirit, if we don't allow Him to have free reign in our hearts, if we don't allow Him to fill us, we're kind of like the new moon. The light's there, it's shining, but nobody can see it, you see? The glory of the Lord doesn't fill the house of God. The glory of the Lord fills us as individuals. And when we let Him fill us, then His light shines through us and His glory Fills the house. And that's what I want to see in the house of God. The question is, friends, is God filling you tonight? He said if you would seek Him, you would find Him. They that seek me early shall find me. Those who ask shall receive. Those who seek shall get it. Those who knock, it shall be opened unto them. Lord, tonight we want you to be the power and the presence among your people tonight. So is He filling you, and are you allowing His glory to shine through you? Can people look at you when you leave this house of worship tonight and say, like Moses coming from the mount with His face glowing, can they look at you and say, surely you have been in the presence of God. Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, we're so grateful for Thy blessings. We're so thankful, Lord, for the privilege to come and worship And Lord, in this country, that's one of the things we are grateful for. We thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship thee. We thank you, God, that we can come and allow you to have your way within us. Now, Father, as we come before this altar, do so, Lord. Have thy way in every heart. Fill us to the point of overflowing that we might rejoice with thee 
and leave this house closer to thee than we were when we came in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed?